So I'm Ana Oliveira from the New York Mass Foundation. I want to welcome everybody and um, just quickly begin by um, asking our incredible uh, team panelists here to introduce themselves. And let's begin with Alia all the way there. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is, oh, on. my name is Alia Baki Vaughn. I'm the executive director of CJI. Circle for Justice Innovations, formerly known as the Criminal Justice Initiative. We were founded in 2000, and we are um, continuing to grant, still in 2019, hopefully forward. Um, we, we only fund organizations that uh, are led by directly impacted people. They have to include the, the uh, leadership of incarcerated people in their incarcerated people and other directly impacted people in the organization. They have to be working for systemic change. They have to be connected in um, some collaborative way to other organizations so they're not working in a silo. And, um, and they must be working to significantly transform, if not abolish the system. But we'll come back to that A <laughs> Hi, thank you everyone. My name is Christina Boyd. I hate to talk in public. <laughs> I'm like, oh. So um, I work at the Open Society Foundations. Um, I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to explain later. Um, so you know, the Open Society Foundations work to build vibrant, tolerant societies whose governments are accountable and open to participation of all people. We have 36 foundations around the world. Um, our livable do donor is George Soros. He's still livable, he's still alive, and he's still very vibrant into the different movement. So I <clears throat> work in, so we divide it up. I work in U.S. programs, and specifically in U.S. Pro programs, we work on the Criminal Justice Fund. And so my slice of the pie to this is we were one of the first in U.S. programs to have individual grant funding. And so I work on the Soros Justice Fellowship. So how many are fellows in here? It seems like a reunion. Mm -hmm. um, so we and, and, and the fellowships are part of a larger effort within the foundation to do, to reduce the destructive impact of the current current criminal justice policy on the individual lives of families. And that's what I'm going to read. Um, I've been doing this work for 17 years. Um, I'm very proud of what I've seen. I came to May. Um, I met her inside. Um, I'm formerly incarcerated, and I was the first ever to be employed. Employed, yes, the first ever in U.S. programs to be employed that is formerly incarcerated. And three months ago, we fired our second. Um, so, um, so we can get all into what does this mean to be formerly incarcerated, work in the movement. I think my biggest contribution to the Soros Justice Fellowship is bringing formerly incarcerated people into the mix of getting fellowships, reducing the educational criteria, and this will be our third, I brought youth in this year, and we're building up our trans community in the fellowships, and we'll talk more about how and why it is important to get people um, and philanthropy in there. I just want to ask a quick question. Is anybody here formerly incarcerated in philanthropy? So, that's good because of what, pardon? Philanthropy, giving money to organizations or individuals giving money. So, that's good because um, last tape from Morris Amazon, I am the only female in philanthropy until this day that was formerly incarcerated. So I'm really looking to seek more people and so we can get together and to strategize and see how we can build power. Thank you. Hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pamela Shipman. I'm with the Novo Foundation. Um, and the Novo Foundation is, um, our mission is to build a more just and balanced world. And for us, that world fundamentally depends on ending all forms of violence and discrimination against all girls and all women okay. everywhere. Um, so we have a very deep focus at the foundation on supporting the rights of adolescent girls and on supporting work that is about ending violence against girls and women globally, which includes here in the US. Um, and that includes the violence of the criminal justice system. So um, yeah, that's what I will say for now, and happy to share more. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Okay, so um, I'll say one thing, a couple of things about the New York News Foundation because just in terms of our accountability and transparency so we cannot be more accessible. I wanted to say that one of the goals that the four of us have is um, to talk about to demystify philanthropy a little bit and to make it more accessible. Um, we will talk about our own, uh, the internal contradictions of philanthropy itself. Yeah. I mean, as you know, we are a product of an incredibly unfair and unjust accumulation of wealth that is part of the system. So I want you to know that everyone in this panel is very aware of that and does not come, does not show up in our work or in our um, approach to philanthropy to reproduce those patterns of um, you know, inequality, racial inequality, gender inequality, and economic inequality. I would say that um, we are working from the inside out in that sense uh, to, to use those means to, to shift. I'm just, you know, it's so you are having a little conversation with a particular set of belief systems within philanthropy. Not everybody in philanthropy believes this, yeah. that's okay, but we want to, and we wanted to be here because of how important it is for us, for you to know that uh, you're not alone. And that um, with all the troubles in philanthropy, that there are plenty of people, some of us are here today, that uh, work very intentionally to dismantle those very things. Okay, so I wanted to say that because that's, that's a, a given to all of us here. Um, so the New York Men's Foundation is a local foundation. It's a public foundation. That means we fundraise for what we give out. We don't have a very large endowment. Um, we, are, we respond more to urgency. And um, like my colleagues, we believe that problems and solutions live in the same place. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that the people that on a daily basis solve <coughs> the problems to their resilience, to their ingenuity, most of the time exceedingly undercapitalized, invisible to most people, and not deemed as experts. Mm -hmm. We all believe the opposite. We believe. Um, that problems and solutions are living with people and that one of the jobs that we have to do is be able to see that, to value that, and then to partner and bring what we can to the table. <coughs> Evidently that includes money, but it's more than that as well. It is a concept of solidarity. Mm -hmm. It is also a concept of fostering on the terms of grantee partners. Uh, the destiny for their mission that they think is correct. Um, I would think none of us here comes to people and tell them what to do, you know, that kind of thing. We, um, if we did, we wouldn't believe that problems and solutions live in the same place. At one point here we will talk about <coughs> also what, how you can access resources and some of the resources that we know that exist about that. We're not going to do just right this second, but we will cover that as well. We want this, this conversation to be very useful to you. So I have a couple of questions to, for my colleagues, and then we're going to open up to you. Is that OK? Yeah, no problem. OK. So um, I talked a little bit about some of our shared values about philanthropy and how we come to this work as, as a group, right? As individuals in this group. But I'm going to ask. Um, our panelists to talk about their personal trajectory, how they come into philanthropy, and what's important to them about that. So, um, okay, sure, thank you. Uh, okay, so I started as an, an activist. Um, my entree into uh, organizing was in the anti-apartheid movement, which um, people may recall was an extraordinarily um, broad um, movement that was multiracial, multi-class, um, multi-faith, and um, Although it was largely led by black leaders, it was not exclusively led by black leaders. And we were working in partnership with the movement in South Africa of those <coughs> who had been oppressed. Basically, what we, in, what in South Africa, they termed the black population, which would mean all the communities um, in South Africa that were not termed white by the government. So, um, so that was my entree. And in that work, I also lived in South Africa for a while and 
when I returned, I was kind of shocked by what had happened. Uh, while I was there, there was this huge transformation that was going on in, this, in the society. The election had just taken place. I had done this uh, work with um, women new, new women who had just been elected to their parliament, and there was this large number of women. And I came back, and we had so few women in the parliament. I mean, in, in the Congress, we had literally reinstated the chain gang in the South. This guy, Pataki, was the governor. I was just like, what the heck happened to my country? So I, 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 um, I started organizing again, and I became involved in the Jubilee movement to cancel Africa's death and an HIV AIDS movement. And um, in the course of that work, I, was, I just became exhausted. I was constantly going, and I said, I really want to continue to contribute to movement but I want, I would like to be paid. <laughs> I would like to have a chance at seeing my family. I mean, I was literally going all day. Now, this is now after 12 days straight of working, so, you know, whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, so I, I started to work for the Riverside Church, and um, because it was a progressive church, they had, I was then the director of social justice ministries there. And during the course of that, of course, I was working to attend some days. Weekend. But anyway, um, during that work, I there was a, one of the one of the thirteen ministries had to do with a, a, a fund that was doing grant making, and I found I was really excited by that. Um, we had you know a little committee and everything. Anyway, sorry, I'm taking too long. Anyway, so I I left when I left Riverside. I went to work for the Peace Development Fund, and that also had a, they had an activist advice grant-making structure, their board was also their grant-making uh, structure, and I was really enthralled by this. They only really hired people who had been activists. That was the course of my work. But this all returns back to my personal family history. My grandmother, um, Irene Morgan, was involved in a case in 1944 in which she was um, a desegregation case. Basically, she was traveling in the South, and she refused to give up her seat. She was returning actually from some, a very serious illness. She refused to give up her seat to a white couple that came on after her. She was arrested, she was kind of manhandled, the sheriff threatened to beat her, and by a series of strokes of luck, she was bailed out by uh, a minister nearby who had quickly gathered enough money to pay her bail before the sheriff got back to beat her. That case became Morgan v. Virginia, which was went on to the Supreme Court, and later on, um, Freedom Riders uh, around the country were involved in mass demonstrations, riding buses to force the federal government to actually implement the law. <laughs> and so the juxtaposition of uh, the law and what the law was saying, my grandmother as being identified as a criminal, <laughs> my the whole movement, the whole movement of people and those who came from all over the country to enforce a law that the government didn't want to enforce, all of that got me involved in activism, and this is why I'm here. So um, at the time at Riverside, I also was involved in, in uh, organizing a demonstration for those social justice ministries, right? And I was um, illegally arrested, I was um, detained, I was illegally strip searched in a hallway by the police under Giuliani, and Eventually, of course, they dropped the charges because they had no proof, and then I sued the city and I won. And um, then I went to the funding exchange, which was this whole network of activist advised grant making. And there in New York, I um, was, was the, the staff person who was in charge of this fund, the Criminal Justice Initiative. So now my political prisoner organizes of Africa, my personal experience at Riverside, my grandmother's history all kind of came together. I fought to get CJ, I, I fought to get that fund to work with it, and, um, and it's been amazing. What the fund does is consensus-based grant making with activists who have been impacted and donors. So we have some donors who are activist donors, some donors who just have money and think criminal justice system sinks. They get all together, they do a lot of work, and they do grant making together and collectively fund organizations around the country that are changing things. Okay, so I'm thinking how I could <laughs> come into this because it's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I came in because of people, um, my inmates, um, two, Michelle Fine, 
Oh, I'm going to try not to cry. The name of the scheme. Ellen Berry Adams, right? Um, so I came in, I was pregnant, and I was one of the first women to ever sue um, the Children of Sor Social Services and one against ASPO. I didn't know what I was doing, but the empowerment of education inside for someone who grew in, um, I'm a farm girl from upstate New York, and yes, white people do go to prison that are poor. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, you know, my race is, I'm white, and I do amount my privilege, but I don't announce my privilege because I'm not privileged. I didn't have support money or anything. My parents couldn't even afford a thousand dollars to even get me out. Um, mm -hmm. I was incarcerated because I was associated with a black male. Um, <clears throat> so it was a lot of the race, I mean, we don't have to go through it. So when I was inside, I was empowered by Kathy and Sh Kathy Boudin, Cheryl Wilkins, I, so many, if I'm missing out on women, to say you gotta learn, you gotta fight, and through education empowered me. Um, I was able to stay in Bedford Hills, it's the only maximum security prison <coughs> in New York State. I was a safe keeper, so I got to go outside, and I actually gave uniforms to the guards. It was such a power trip. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, how many shirts do you want? That's my first advocacy. I was like, yeah, you don't deserve your extra shirt. <laughs> so it was sort of a power trip. And so there was, um, in prison college program, um, college community fellowship was developed because they needed women on the outs. When women got... Um, released on the outside, there was nowhere for us to finish our education. So again, Vinay and um, Barbara Markinson and Michelle Fine was even on the board to give us an opportunity to come home with, with services um, and to continue education. And a shout out to Sister Tiza, who is my mother. I gave my kid, I won my kid back, by the way, and she took him um, after a year. But what had happened, the Open Society Foundation finally decided they we're going to put their money where their mouth was. Because they were supporting criminal justice reform, reform and they were just starting with a uh, person, Susan Tucker, Tanya Koch, decided that we had to hire a formerly incarcerated person, and we're going to CCF since they didn't see money. And so they wanted someone with a BA. Well, they had that for two years. Nobody was coming out because we know college prison programs. Mm -hmm. They were only offered in the long-termers prison. They're not, they weren't coming out. And I got out. And so I went, so I was their poster child. I wasn't seeing I was just their poster child. And I was thankful, and I said, thank you, Massa. Thank you for everything. And I did everything, and I I'm the best damn cop here. You would have, I can copy. <laughs> and then it got to the point where I started to get more educated. And I was like, wait a minute. You, does, you need me. I don't need you. And so as I got more empowered and into different groups like you all, and listen, and Ellen Bear was like, what are you doing? You're not just the poster child. I developed a fight, and I knew there was a huge culture shift that had to be in the foundation. We are in the Justice Fund, and I'm meeting all these dynamic people, and now they put me on the Soros Justice Fellowship. I don't know if they regret it to this day. <laughs> no, I don't. Do not and so I started to fight. And I said, we need to get formerly incarcerated people on there. And we got to eliminate the education barrier. They'll get their education. Because they're really crackerjack um, advocates. Because Soros Justice Fellowship started off as a intern for attorneys. Yes. Right? And then we switched over. And then Helena Hong was involved. And she said, you know what? We're going to really flood the gates. Um, and at that time, people weren't graduating in college. They didn't graduate with college from all over the world. They were just kick-ass advocates. Um, today, I don't think I would have my job, nor would I get a fellowship, because the competition is spot on. But so that's how I came to it. And I became more empowered. Um, I saw cultural shifts have to change, and they have to change now. We're probably 30 years behind, and I'm culturally changing. It has been a culture, a fight. When I came out here, I really advocated for the ASCO ball. I was like, I'm an advocate, I'm, I'm an advocate, and as I grew, I realized, you know, these women, I remember Vivian Nixon, I, I'm sure y'all know Vivian, mm -hmm. and I met her, and though I didn't like her at first, because she was really uh, with me, I was like, you're a kick-ass advocate, here you go, you got to go in front of these men, because I'm not an advocate, and then I realized, with raising my own son, that I knew what my place was, I miss advocacy, I miss you know, miss being in the center, but that's not my place. 
My place is changing the culture change that has to be done in philanthropy. Mm -hmm. We have no people, we have nobody that's in charge, program officers, on the board of directors that have power making decisions. Um, and that's my mission from now on. It's like, I understand all the abstrosities that sometimes goes with philanthropy, but I'm glad I'm there because I can read a proposal and if someone hasn't elegantly written their proposal, I can see through those words. Um, those who written their proposal, um, had someone else write their proposals and weren't, I can write, I can see that too. <laughs> I can also know how to my, I will say, this just came last month, my worth is knowing people and feeling people and knowing that we need those privileged Ivy League people just as much as we need the people that were on the ground because it makes a community. We got to have our advocates go to the people that can get into those privileged positions to change the laws. So we need a community of all. So when we build cohorts now, I look at it all. And I just never thought I would defend someone that had a Harvard League Ivy education that is very rich. But she wanted to be a fellow. And I'm like, wow, she didn't get a scanning. She didn't want an echoing green. So this is what I do. And I said, this is my my entry into this world. And for the next until I until I see more and more formerly incarcerated people in power positions, not administrative roles, power positions that can actually take the money and say, This is what we're gonna be funding, I'm not gonna stop. And until this day we brought youth, we brought youth, me uh, myself and Adam Colbreth. Um, and then I see the emergence of funding restorative justice circles. That's only unheard of. Um, and then we can get in later. I mean, there's a lot more, and I'm sorry I went over time, but we can go in the challenges of what's happening. So that's how I got into philanthropy. It just happened to fall in my lap. <laughs> Yeah, I think I um, got into philanthropy totally by accident. Um, I got into it because I was an activist and I have spent my life um, as an activist for women and girls. I think as a young child, I like saw the profound racism and sexism all around me and experienced the sexism. Um, and we're seeing the ways particularly that the, the girls I was growing up with, how many girls were experiencing sexual abuse in their homes, were experiencing domestic violence and it was like everywhere. And I um, really committed my life when I was very young to working to address that. I, um, a good friend of mine in high school was, was shot by her boyfriend and she survived, um, she survived, he did not survive. And I think at that time I was like, this can't keep going on like this. He, um, he killed himself after that. And I, I, I really made the choice like when I was that age that I wanted to that this was going to be what I did for my life's work. Um, and similarly, I actually, my very most formative life experience was um, that I had this incredibly lucky experience of working in South Africa and living in South Africa in the mid 90s, mm. right after um, apartheid had ended. And I, for some like literally stroke of luck, I was hired by the African National Congress, the Parliamentary Women's Caucus to be able to support them to develop um, legislation on domestic violence in South Africa. And um, I feel like everything I know about the world I learned from the women I worked for there. Like they really trained me in everything that I know. And I think about, I, they are the mentors that I still hold today. And I go back to thinking about how they would do things and the ways in which they held the most radical transformative vision of what is possible. Yeah. Like for them it was like, it wasn't about ending apartheid. It was about ending apartheid, but it was about like what is like liberation going to look like in this country? Yeah. Like how are we going to live in a totally transformed world? Um, and the way they held that vision so deeply, and the way they worked in ways that were so accountable to mm -hmm. communities, so accountable to the women that they had, um, that they were accountable to. From you know that, and they they did this in every way possible. I mean, I remember when I showed up and I, um, my boss at the time who was chairing the committee um, for women in parliament said I have to, I need to go out to all the rural communities to hear from women about what the rural women's bill is going to look like. And I was like, oh, you, they don't come here? And she was like, of course not. I'm going to go to every community and talk to them in their own community because that's like what we do. 
And I thought I could never have imagined that in like the U.S. Congress. I was like trying to imagine my senator at the time, you know, in Mich from Michigan, like actually like traveling to rural communities to listen, to really deeply listen. And I, so I've really, um, I try to hold that example and I, they are just like my, um, yeah, it's where I, my most important experience. But I, I've had kind of since that time lots of different work um, doing global women's and girls' rights work. Um, and I, you know, accident, I was working at the UN, I was working um, at UNICEF, working on violence against women in situations of armed conflict. So I was supporting um, organizations on the ground who were doing um, like rape crisis work mostly in, in Darfur and Congo and other places where lots of violence was happening. Um, and I was really happy in this work and I ended up getting this funny call from the foundation where I now work, which said, do you want to come in and just for a meeting to brief us so we can learn more about this, about violence against women? And I said, sure, I'll, I'd be happy to. And then I came in and had this meeting and um, was really struck because it was a new foundation at the time and they were the founders, um, Jennifer and Peter Buffett who founded it, were really interested in figuring out how to use money for good and figuring out how to use money in a way that would um, be transformative and would, you know, really, they, they felt like it wasn't their money, it was made, you know, because of a completely, um, I'm swearing, I'm like, fucked up system of like, <laughs> of, yeah, really, you know, a horrible system which, you know, allows this ridiculous unfettered wealth to accumulate to some people for, at the expense of others. And they were really interested in how to like transform that. So I felt like I had a real opportunity to come in and figure out how to um, do good with these resources. You know, I didn't ever expect to do that, but I felt like this is really an opportunity to, um, you know, I think I think until, until we no longer have capitalism and no longer have a system that relies on, founda on right. foundations, yeah. they shouldn't be there. We shouldn't have foundations. And while we have them, I wanted to um, be able to help resource the work that um, feels like it needed to be resourced. Yes. yes. So, um, Christina just told us one, a very important thing that philanthropy can do and should do to um, create the world that Pamela and Ali are talking about, right? <laughs> to bring, uh, which is the employing throughout mm -hmm. and having mm -hmm. uh, folks with lived experience, justice-related experience throughout philanthropic organizations. Um, let me ask you, what else can philanthropy do <coughs> from your perspectives that um, can have a value? What do you think are the most pressing things that we could do something of value? Um, it's so hard to, uh, you know, we all get siloed, so I'm siloed in my mm -hmm. foundation because I know the great work you've, you've done, because I've been a recipient of your work, and mm -hmm. the great Novo's on, and then mm -hmm. on CJI. So I'm sorry, I'm going to take this sort of siloed, if that's okay, because I'm really not, and believe it or not, I just got into the power position. <laughs> I mean, it really, so it's sort of new. But um, for my foundation, I would like to see all of our board members come to something. I think that we need to accept, we have a livable donor, and um, it's hard, you know, it's his strategies, it's his money, and we have a board of directors. I, we are hoping and engaging that the board will be shook up a little bit, because all of our, we have budgets, we have strategies, and they have to be board approved. So I would like, to, immediate needs is that the board needs to come down and to see really what's on the ground I think they do think they are doing good work. I believe they think they are going, but they're from privilege. And so their ground is the middle, is our middle. It's not the ground. I also, in our foundation, we have policy, legislation, policy. I wish they would understand that con what we need immediate concern is understanding the conditions and confinement work that we don't fund or tend to fund. This is, and as I've been advocating, if you look at any organization, and the one that I was a recipient of was our children, you will see there's leadership component built in there. You will see that there's policy change. You will see that if we don't fund 
the immediate concern with the hit from this administration and from the hit from philanthropy. These people are housing the immigrants so they do not go overseas, so they don't deport them. They are dying out here. And as I told at our retreat, you've got to understand, conditions and confinement is your policy and legislation that you are concerned about today because you would not know about them. So that my immediate concern, George Soros, <laughs> we need to fund conditions and confinement. <laughs> so that's my immediate concern and hope that they would understand the complexity of what policy really is. Hi, thank you. Because I definitely agree with that. Um, so for me, I see the role of CDI as being um, a partner in movement, right? We're trying to grow and strengthen a movement that's going to transform the system that we have now, transform our end, the system that we have now, right? And so what we have to do is make sure that we remember that the problems and the solutions live together, right? And so the, it's not a terrible thing for somebody who has had a great deal of privilege to be involved in helping to solve a problem. But to think that they are the only person who can lead this, that can tell everybody else what needs to be done and make that happen, that's problematic. Philanthropy really loves that. Like, the more letters you have behind your name, the more, supposedly, the more, you know, um, learned you are and more likely to be able to come up with a solution, which is actually the opposite of what we're trying to do. So for me, um, what I think is most important for philanthropy to do is to recognize that we can support the people who have the great ideas and then just give them the resources that they need so that they can increase the impact of the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And there's just nothing wrong with that. It's like sometimes people in philanthropy think that that's a bad thing. And I just don't, I just don't. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And then the, and so one of the things that we're going to be trying to do at CJI is to be providing a more assistance to our grantees so that they can have the information that they need to do better, right? So better at getting money for themselves, better at doing the things that are necessary for them to be seen by other foundations. We see the movement. In other words, we provide um, like funding to small organizations that come up with these really phenomenal ideas. So some examples of that would be Ban the Fox, we were one of the earliest funders of that. Um, it would be anti-shackling legislation. When we started, there were eight states now, it's like 28 states, but we still need to get the state funding, even though some stuff happened at the federal. Each state also has their own laws and how they impact women. I mean, do you understand that we are chaining women when they are giving birth? Like, wow, how graphic is that? Like, how is that still allowed to take place in our country? Mm -hmm. So there are, there are, you know, these are things that we help, um, alternatives to incarceration, we help support uh, Flick, who was one of the first people who started talking about the school to prison pipeline. Um, a lot of a lot of innovative, wonderful concepts that we now think of as things that should be done started with those folks who had that experience. And what we found, and we have a particular um, privilege in that we used to fund criminal justice work based just on what the work was, right? And then when we made it a requirement that the organizations who applied to us had to include the voices of directly impacted people, what we saw was that the applications changed, right? <laughs> so that's where the shackling application came, right? Because it came from women who had been shackled and had tried to give birth. They said, this was one of the most horrific experiences I've ever had, something that's supposed to be a loving, wonderful, fantastic experience. <coughs> and so what would happen is these wonderful, well-intentioned, hard-working social workers who had been doing all this work for all those years didn't even occur to them to do something about this. And so that's because they didn't experience it. And so that doesn't make the other folks bad or wrong or horrible. It just means that if you center the focus on the people who are experiencing the problem, they will tell you what their priority is. It's not our job to tell them what the priority is. Our job is simply to fund and resource that work so that the movement continues and grows. And that's how I perceive it. So that's what I, I am always talking to um, our partners, and we have lots of wonderful partners who are doing really great work now in collaborative ways, in funding, in all kinds of 
um, methodologies that I think are really exciting. And so that's what I'm really excited about. Because when we started doing it, we were, there were not many <laughs> that were funding criminal justice in particular, um, which we now are calling the criminal legal system, because the justice is far and wide away from it. And our, there were not many of them that were funding grassroots organizations. There are, there are lots more that do it now. But, um, some of the folks here were doing that, some of them still not doing some um, conditions of confinement. When I say them, I don't mean y'all, I'm talking about other institutions. So um, that's what I would do. So um, let's talk about some of the things that, you just talked about some things that, that have been effective mm -hmm. and are very promising. In something that Alia said, you know, um, it's a kind of a, a problem sometimes for us in philanthropy is that in order to, to be able to fund uh, leaders and organizations on the ground, we're always a little bit late. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? If, if we're not out there telling people what to do, because we are not that kind of people, the challenge for us is always to see fast. You know what I mean? To see the action fast to see movements happening fast. And I'm going to say in a humbling manner, correct course, you know, direct the, the funding there. Um, evidently, you know, Pamela was talking about there are, and, and so did Christina, you know, we, we, there are structures in these organizations that we work, right? But so the challenge and part of that work from inside that Christina is talking about is making the structures be more nimble. Does that make sense? Make the structures be more responsive to what's going on outside. But, and, and narrow that time gap between the need and the arrival of resources, yes? So um, I wanted to say that that's something that we, you know, like wanting the board to be the issue of proximity to. Brian Stevenson talks about that very compellingly, right? And we live in our realities that sometimes, although folk are really as Aliyah is saying, they want to be part of the solution, right? If they don't have even lived experience, but they understand, they benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Pamela talked about that, and they want to be part of the change. It, it's important to create proximity, mm -hmm. because that really helps to um, move the agendas of funding faster, mm -hmm. just being very candid. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there are ways that that's done. One of the ways that it's done is in grant makings, the listening tours that Pamela was talking about. You know, the idea of philanthropy going where people are and turning over the voice to the people so it can be informed. It's the idea of recruiting uh, community volunteers, not because of particular education or this or that, but um, to help and to make decisions about the grant making. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So there are participatory yeah. grant making kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It's the idea of the connections that Aliyah is talking about between community and donors sitting around and making decisions, right? So these changes are happening in philanthropy, and even as they are, you know, we are constantly fine-tuning ourselves to be able to do them faster and to be able to do them more. I wanted to say that um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the, the, the gap between the need and the resources mm -hmm. that actually are available today. Mm -hmm. And I, we don't mean to say that that's, uh, nobody's comfortable with that, but we're all working to put more there. But there is an enormous gap between uh, the need and uh, the amount of resources that are um, intentionally dedicated. I'm just going to say this to communities of color, period. Mm -hmm. Within that, cis and trans women of color. Yes. It, it starts decreasing, okay? As you keep going down, it starts decreasing. Yes. yes. Then we go to cis and trans and non gender non-binary women yeah. involved in any kind of system. And it could be the, the child welfare system, a precursor yeah. to, to, the, to the criminal justice system. Uh, the justice system, you know, the resources, they start going down like a funnel, you know, like that. And um, the four of us and others, uh, we have colleagues in other foundations, um, are involved 
in opening up their funnel. Yeah. Yeah. It's making sense. So in each of our uh, realities, it be that we fundraise more than the New York mm -hmm. Foundation. We recently just launched, this was in October, a fund, and I want to tell you about that because I wanted to talk about accessibility, right? You're coming to this conversation, we want you to walk away with all kinds of opportunities and places mm -hmm. of how you can access the resources and how we can listen to you, right? So it's a, it's a local fund that um, is supporting uh, community leadership. Just begun. We just made, we just gave out a little bit of money. We're going to be giving out more and more and more. So for instance, uh, very practically, I think um, in May, we're going to put out other opportunities for people to apply. We, this set of opportunities will particularly focus in um, small organizations. Like Aliyah, um, and I know that's the case for Pamela as well, um, we prioritize and we focus on by organizations. Organizations with, by the leadership, by the voice. Does that make sense? And um, that's the priority. And in the case, um, we will be able to get dollars out there to folks that um, might not be um, yet at a stage of organizational development that other larger foundations would be able to see. So to do that, we're also going to offer, ahead of that, we're going to offer opportunities to talk with you just about even like, you know, the application won't be that complicated, but still, how do you relate to that application? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like um, foundations, we all offer something called capacity building, um, typically after people get a grant. We are going to offer a little bit of that before. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that you can actually, um, you know, and we don't want anybody um, spending time writing proposals or doing things complicated. We want to be very user friendly. It's an opportunity to get to know us better and for us to get to know you better. But that will be in May, and I will tell you we use a participatory grant making thing. That means that there will be volunteers that we train doing those site visits. So the funding will probably be um, in the beginning of the fall, around September or so. Um, I am getting guidance from the incredible team of the foundation, Kate and Alitia and Vivian, and we will be available to talk with you after. But this is our own wanting to catch up with uh, incredible work that so many of you are doing. We haven't been able at all to fund um, where we want to be funding yet. We have been able to put out about, I think, um, $800,000 we have put out, but more is coming and you will be continuing to come every year. So you can always look to the foundation, tell us what uh, we can do to support you to access those dollars. Um, the other thing is that um, catching up, we're catching up. Christina, we will be, we, I just want to tell you, the foundation is looking for our, our Christina. The foundation is looking for our first, it will be the last or the only one, a uh, fellow. And, um, Although um, we, I think it's very appropriate, we want to intentionally prioritize uh, cis and trans women with uh, lived experience in any kind of um, system. Mm -hmm. So I want you to know that those applications are also going to be going out there and available to you. Just I wanted to get a little bit practical to, to, so that you know, we can begin to talk about resources. But I do want to say that even though there are little progresses that we make here and there. <clears throat> it, they are not yet appropriate. You know, there's a lot of philanthropy activism that we are doing yes. and need to do more to draw more resources there. Is this making sense to you? Mm -hmm. So let me ask Pamela and uh, you before we go to others. Yeah. Yeah. And do you want to add anything about what could be helpful for people what are, you know, you know, open society obviously funds, right? We all fund. But let's talk a little bit about what could be helpful, what is going on in philanthropy, um, you know, that way. I can share something, yeah. You know, well, first of all, just to say I totally appreciate what you say, Anna. I think one of the things when we have been um, 
You know, our, our work specifically, I mean, I think, um, as I shared, we have supported work to end violence against women and girls for a long time. I mean, we've only been around for 12 years, but mm -hmm. since that time, and in realizing the ways in which we were not resourcing formerly incarcerated women, and we weren't, the, we were not resourcing the leadership of formerly incarcerated women, and it was like a real gap mm -hmm. for us. And that is, um, it's not acceptable given you know, given how important that work is and the powerful leadership that is out there and how related violence is to incarceration for women, right? So that yeah. felt, it was yeah. so fundamental and it was something that is, was a huge gap that we needed yes. to deal with. So, um, you know, let me say two quick things about this. One is that, um, that we just did this kind of internal scan, just looking at kind of the philanthropic landscape to see where resources were and you know, not surprising to anyone in this room, right? We saw that almost all of the criminal justice money was going to men, and yeah. almost all of the work for women and girls was not going to criminal justice. So it was like, there was this little, like, thing in the middle that was tiny, right? That's teeny tiny, and we know that there, there is under-resourced, yes. like, radically under-resourced. So, um, as Anna said, I think one of the um, jobs that we have on this panel, all of us, right, is to increase that pie because it is not an acceptable, yeah. it's not acceptable right now. Um, yeah, so th that's what that's I'll right. say for now. Yeah, that's yeah, that's all. Amazing. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say something about that. So one of the things that I'm really proud of with CJI is that, although, you know, I'm talking a small fund folks. I mean, really, we, we had a small year where we only gave away $80,000, right? So this, this past year, we had a half a million dollars in our general docket. We had um, another program called um, Starving the Beast that was specifically looking at communities that have been uh, excluded or under-resourced around drug involvement uh, that did not lead to incarceration, right? So we have a whole program there. And then we did a Quest for Democracy grant in partnership with FICPFM. Uh, that Starving the Beast program was in partnership with OSF. The, uh, Starving the, Be uh, the Quest for Democracy program um, funded um, Bail reform, um, sorry, bail reform, voter reenfranchisement, law enforcement accountability, and restoration of rights outside of um, civic engagement. But the one thing that I wanted to say about our, our docket is that I just did a little bit of research, mm -hmm. and I found that in every docket that I could see from when we started in 2001, women and girls have been about 60% of mm -hmm. our docket. Mm -hmm. So the majority of the groups that we have funded have been women and girls. That that means women and girls working on criminal justice issues with women who have been formerly incarcerated. And so that is great, but it's not enough. And so we're hoping to launch a new program, Free Her, um, grant-making program, specifically looking at the issues that impact women and girls later this year uh, in October. So Okay, so some suggestions. So I got with my colleagues, I said, I'm going to come here and I'm going to talk and because I do individual grant making and I'm proud of it because I feel we seated the leadership that you see today. We seated the Susan Burtons, we seated the Michelle Alexanders, we seated Benita Gupta, and we got ahead of the leadership curve. However, I'm not the organization grant. I know most of you are here, like, how do we get into OSI and get a meeting to get money? And so I said, you know, I just wanted to let you know, at OSI, we look at long-term strategies. Even though we only get two years for the funding, they seem to fund the same organizations over a long period of time. And the questions for all of you all are like, how do I get in the door? How do I get money? Yes. It's difficult. Because our, 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 honest to God, our answer to you, go to the community funds that are already strapped and don't have enough money to do that. So it's very difficult. So one way they did it was individual grants. But we're strapped because what they're seeing, we have an explosion at OSF today of individual grant making. And I think if you want to get in on your project, that's a great way to go. There's a lot of flexibilities, there's a lot of ways. However, I've seen an emergence over the last seven years, especially in the formerly incarcerated movement, where everybody wants to create their 5013C. And if you're in that predicament now, and if you want, first of all, don't rely on big open society money. That's usually two years and out, unless you're an ACLU or some of the bigger organization that can sustain themselves. Um, 
put a business model into your, I met with um, some people from Oklahoma, wonderful indigenous people who said there's no such thing as money for you. You guys are just like the golden mm -hmm. guild up there. So we created arts and craft and you know, create a business mm -hmm. model. And one thing I'm trying to encourage is get more economic individual fellows into the fellowship mm -hmm. cohort to tell our fellows, because it's so sad after 18 months, goodbye, we can't fund you anymore. And then they're left out. Mm -hmm. And it's just like they're wonderful projects. And it's just like at the same time, they should be funded. Could we lose someone back in the system? I mean, this is always, and it's almost like if I can get an economic fellow to think of how do you put a business model into a not for profit mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. For all of you who want to start a 5013C, I would caution you not to. <laughs> Build coalition. Because when OSF, to be, I'm just being frank with you all, in order for you to get a meeting, they want to see your coalition. They don't want to see, this one's doing the same work from here to here to here. If you all get together, and I'm sorry, just going to call it out, stop the inroad fighting and the mm -hmm. stargazing. Because philanthropy is famous for promoting stars. They'll give them the funding, they get all the funding, and we get our egos built up, and guess what happens? Bye. And then they create dysfunction in the movement. If we stop right. building stars, right. if we start building coalition, and I'm talking for the formerly incarcerated because that's where I'm thing, and we start building and collaborating, strategizing, and say, listen, we're 300 strong across five nations. We want a meeting. I can almost guarantee you, and if not, call, call me, that you'll take a, they'll take a meeting. But if you come with your small organization, you're just starting, I'm sorry to say, they, we would love to fund it. The people in there are good hearted. It's just our board won't let us fund that. It's not our strategy. They're not going to pass it. But so that's one way you can start rethinking. Um, individual grants at OSI is is it's going to soar. It's even going to soar even more. Um, we got the new Equality Fellows, the Leadership and Government Fellows. I just talked to two colleagues from the international that I didn't even know who they were. That's how we don't talk. And I'll tell you what's emerging. And everybody said, "Oh, Trump's in." Should I? <laughs> I can say it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I said, I said, it's a good thing he's in because people won't go, right? right? And one thing happened with even our foundation. It's like America's okay. We got Barack Obama. They're going to be okay. We're going to flood all the money overseas. But if you were in the last meeting, you could see how much reliant the international people are on similar. Um, what's the word? Symbolize and replicating America. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they pulled yeah. money out of our U.S. programs, but guess what? They're not going to do it anymore because they're collapsing. Everything is collapsing internationally. We also, the international women, said we don't have a vibrant women's portfolio on the side. We have a black male achievement campaign, and trust me, I was pissed as hell. I was like, I don't care if I have to go to George Soros. I was in the South. Why isn't women in there? But it was the best thing for the foundation because now they started funding pots of women. And now I'm not going to shut up because they are thinking the International Women's Program, which funds the international women, are now convinced as of today, I just talked to them, that U.S. American women are going to be part of their strategies because we are international as well. Yes. And they will be funding, they'll be funding into our fellowship cohort. So, and... So that's just the, some of the facts, the fictions. How do you get in? How do you take a meeting? Um, my suggestion, you got a fellow right now. Um, you're in a, a hot organization, but it's small. Um, the fellowship, you cannot do the, your organization's mission. They have to do a separate problem. It could be similar, but it could be separate. But it's a way to say, well, you know, we want to explore this issue, but we don't have enough funding to explore it. Put a fellow up there. And say, okay, why don't you do this project? This is not what we're doing. If we had more funding, we would do it in support. But Tanya, you could even, or Ellen could even talk about the support of building cohort. Um, Ellen was one of our first in 19, uh, 1996.5 year. Um, we are now over 300 strong and actively about 200. I get calls about 200. We have an annual conference. And now we have brought into the conference Everybody. Kathy with Dean. Mm -hmm. Panay's was a fellow. Cheryl. Cheryl. So, I mean, it's just like convening power. OSF has convening power, which we don't talk about. Philanthropy has convening power. They don't have to give out grants. 
but I have opened up the doors at OSI for Andrea James. She was a fellow and she started her free, um, I, the National big Council. word, National and Council. so they didn't have convening, so I said, come into the office, we'll give you some few snacks, we'll give you some, I, um, I was going to give you some IV, um, give you some <laughs> IV. <laughs> and I mean, see, that's another way philanthropy can serve the community. Mm. Open it up, give them some convening power, mm. and you know what? To, for an ordinary person to walk through that door of the gilded gates, it's amazing, it's empowerment. So that's another way we're doing it, is it, it's just yeah. building, and we use our annual social justice, mm -hmm. and I'm always getting all these new, bring your youth, let them know. I mean, one day they're gonna get, I'm gonna get in trouble for it, but I'm just like bringing everybody like, look, who is the next leaders? Who are your older leaders? And we do need also older leaders, the historical Elder, yeah. elders that we've lost in this community. We need them to come on back. So. So this is just some of the ways that you can get inside. Um, some cautionary tales about big funding. I wouldn't rely on it too much. Um, and and I'm sorry, I wish the community funders, because those are your strengths. They're the communities, they're gonna, they're really gonna fund the fundamental change. Policy isn't fundamental or sustainable change. It's community building and community movements. Those are gonna fund. And OSN tends to give grants to the community foundations to do that, um, but I wish it was more. I wish we had an endless pot of money. But so this is some of the ways. Um, I hope that's helpful a little bit. So the practical thing about what Christina is saying is that so then you should pay attention to the New York Women's Foundation because our grants will be small, but they'll be easier to get. They will be the grants. You don't have to have a 501c3, right? You don't have to have that. You can. We can. Uh, support a project, we can support the coalition building, yep. we can support, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah. You know, so they are more modest grants, much smaller, mm -hmm. easier to get, designed to get the, the steps, you know, that we're talking about. And it is true, you know, and this is beyond that. This is not about criminal justice, this is not about women. Typically in philanthropy, you don't get a big grant in your first grant. Mm -hmm. right. you know I mean, it's just yeah. like, how this system is. I'm not saying that it's fair, I'm just saying. So that's why the fund and the, the foundation are designed to support the growth to get there. Does that make sense to you? So as Christina is saying, look to us, that's where we can give you this, the, what you need now, you know, to get to the next step, all right? And please, I just wanted to echo again the importance of fellowships. Mm -hmm. We are learning and beginning them. But I wanted to echo the importance of that. Yeah. And I wanted to say something that mm -hmm. it's also because, you know, you're always doing stuff for other people, right? And I know that we're doing for ourselves yeah. and we're doing for other people. But a fellowship is also a time for self. Yeah. You know, it's mm -hmm. really important to also invest in your own leadership. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say that because it's something that you are doing, the fellowship does, and um, you know, it's really important to also center yourself. And I want to ask Pamela to share a terrific thing that the Novo Foundation is doing that goes right with what Christina is talking about as well. Um, I will, but one other thing just to mention, and I think just to mention the um, Girls and Young Women of Color Fund so also at, yeah. that we've been partnering on, um, yes. which is housed at the New York Women's Foundation, I think is another really excellent opportunity yes um, and I don't rem yeah I think so even just thinking like broader than um, anything that's even necessarily called Absolutely. related to um, criminal justice it's you know much broader but I think that that would be a really good opportunity and I don't remember when is it the next so the next I also think that it's in early May similar to similar line, time, okay. May and uh, very important what Pamela is saying actually that fund um, funds criminal justice work yeah, as well exactly. It's not just in the justice fund. Exactly. You know, the funds work by and for mm -hmm. young women mm -hmm. of color in New York City. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But you yeah. would love yeah. for you okay. to also talk okay. about other stuff. Like okay, that. okay, great, yeah. Um, so I think what Anna is referring to, just to um, share, I think if, for those who were here last night, um, it was brought up, but the, um, we are super excited to be working on a project really in deep partnership with um, many formerly incarcerated women to transform Bayview 
women's correctional facility yes. into the women's building of New York City, Woo! which is, yeah, we're excited. Yes. So this, yes. Yes. This, um, this initiative really, um, you know, is a, I think a really, um, I think it's a really powerful example of how we can work together to do really amazing things. Um, and that it really has a lot of creativity and vision in it. And so much of that is led by women who were incarcerated at Bayview and other facilities um, not Bayview. But you know, when we first, we were looking for a site to create a women's building because we had heard so much from activists in New York how, how challenging it is to find office space that is affordable, how challenging it is to be able to find space to be able to coordinate with other organizations that are similar, you know, that to be able to like share photocopiers, to be able to yeah. find ways to really meet and connect, to have childcare on site, to be able to do things that we, you know, will make it easier to be able to do our work more successfully. Yes. So when we were looking and when Bayview became available, um, it was shut down, um, as some of you might know, during Hurricane Sandy. Um, and so the state was selling it. Um, we really did a lot of consultation with women who were on the inside at Bayview to ask them whether it was a good idea to turn this into a women's building or not. And we you know, led a series of focus groups and the conversations. And it really came back that we should take this opportunity to transform this place of confinement into a place of liberation and possibility. And it's been an amazing um, and challenging journey, I think, all along the way of, we have a really fierce group of advisors, 20 women, cis and trans, who are helping to reimagine the space, to select the architect, to um, figure out what is gonna be in there. We have a commitment to having 35% women who are working the building in the trades, in the construction trades. We know that there's less than 3% women in construction in New York, right? These are like good union jobs. Yep. Um, and women have been shut out of these jobs. And women of color in particular have been shut out of these jobs. So this is um, really an incredible opportunity. And I think the vision, to say that I think the leadership and vision of women who were incarcerated have led the way in terms of imagining what the resiliency and sisterhood is possible when the women's building is open. Yeah. And um, I have been so just, my own personal, I've been so incredibly grateful for what I have learned through this process and continue to learn and feel like we are gonna do something really powerful together that is going to be um, serving all movements, not not only like one organization, it, it's like actually going to be a movement hub that will be available to be able to you know, bring people together. So. Thank you. There's something similar like that going on in Atlanta right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, Maryland. 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 It's amazing. And we help support one in yes. when Flick closed down Tallulah oh. after Katrina. Uh, it was oh, a similar I didn't know situation. That. I knew yeah. about Atlanta, so, but I didn't know. Yeah, oh, this is a phenomenal amazing. thing that, that yeah. um, oh. and all of these initiatives it's, were led by women. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Okay. Yay. So uh, we want to open up to yeah. questions. You have a question? Mm -hmm. Please. I want to speak plus I have a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. My name is Josephine Fantasia for Reverend Royal Walker. I'm a transgender woman. I'm not only a transgender woman, I'm a client, a patient, and a resident, and also a activist, serious. Not only am I an activist, I'm an employee now today. And that took a lot of hell of work to cry to people who are not of our gender. Melissa Baker, um, National, Black, um, National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, mm -hmm. right? I'm also here with the Sylvia Rivera Pro mm -hmm. Project. Mm -hmm. I came a little late, they mm -hmm. wanted me to be here, but I came a little late. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also part of AOP who's struggling right now, mm -hmm. and I need the doors open for me. Mm -hmm. And we need trans justice community school to stay open. Mm -hmm. It's education, training about political, you know, mm -hmm. all that work. NITAC, we definitely need them to stay. They have helped me with a job also. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Mm -hmm. I work for those two organizations. And I live at Housing Works as a resident client and patient. Mm -hmm. But I also go to Destination Tomorrow in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. See, the struggle is finding the right buildings was low, low cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. that yes. money goes quick. Mm -hmm. yes. Prince is Janae's face, my Javon, my uncle. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'll say that, that on Sooner Rebel Law Project, they're doing well. Yeah. They need 
you know, we're just in a struggle of trans-led organizations yes. ran by trans people. Yes. Or we don't need to share office space. We want our own space. Because, you know, there's some things like, I, I, I quit my job at a block where they gave it back to me. The reason why they gave it back to me is I told them how I felt. Some of their workers were gossiping about I was talking too much mess about NITAC. I love NITAC. I love my sisters and brothers that work for NITAC. Amanda Bavon and Kiara, the CEO. My mother, Tanya Walker Antipanda Johnson, is the co-founder. Kiara St. James is the CEO. I'm the outreach specialist. I bring information back to organization agents, let them know that we have workshops and trainings. We're the, NITAC, I can say NITAC and AOP, is one of the two organizations that need, desperately need support and Princeton to make it. Yes. So I'm asking y'all to help not yes. the best way as yes. possible. Mm -hmm. Also, as activists, as leaders, as employers, as educators, we all need to work together in these communities. When we talk stuff, we need to work together as community. Who we are, who the elected officials, Everybody, we need to go in hard, hard. They need numbers. When y'all have them trips to Albany and Washington, D.C. to fight on different issues, they need numbers. We also need to add transgender inclusive in all services that get grants, fundings, or got more money, more grants funding. Add transgender women, men, boys and girls, gender non-performing, and the youth does count. Because I work at Johnny Guadalupe's program where he gives me gift cards because, you know, I, they're, they're not hiring nobody right now. He wants me to take a train and put the press. And I do a good out, good ass job of doing outreach mm -hmm. and bringing people into communities. I helped a woman get into my transitional housing program at Housing Works mm -hmm. who had mental illnesses but also yes. had HIV at the same time. Yes. If it wasn't for me, she wouldn't be blessed with what she's at today. You know? Because she was a heterosexual woman with mental illnesses, HIV positive. She finally got into the place, and after being there for a certain amount of years, they housed her. It's a permanent housing. So, six months to a year, shelters and programs that are getting granted and funded, like SROs, right? They need to house people within the six months to a year. You're not supposed to be there over a year. So, housing is a big thing in society. Yeah, Especially if you have grants and yes. funding written for it. Yeah. I also need to say, victims of rape, domestic violence, hate crimes, and child molestation. Something needs to be done with that. The police department needs to be trained, and so do the courts. Mm -hmm. Training is a big key. So we need to plan appointments with these um, law people. We need to also educate lawyers that don't support trans or don't know what trans is about. There should be mandatory training on these issues. Okay, we got some police that are good and some that are bad. We have some elected officials that are good and bad. We have some organizations that are good and bad. But by us working together, united, we'll never be defeated. Yes. You know yes. What I, mean? right. I yeah. also work with That's Black Lives right. Matter, People's Power yes. Assembly, and NYC Shut It Down. Okay. So okay. these are organizations okay. that, I mean, we just need to work together. Yes. And these kids are the future, and these teenagers and young adults are yes. the future. I'm not, I'm not trying to discriminate, but I'm just saying, they should get t two chances. Strike three, you're out. I don't know why they have sex offender programs and why they're in our areas where the schools are at. We need to protect our children and our teenagers of this world too. We need to educate them and acknowledge them to talk to their parents and talk to people that they don't know that gives funding and grants. Okay. Because you or your citizens council. So I wanted to appreciate you for coming um, in this, and also want to say that both Audrey Law Project, AOP, yes. as well as Silver Rivera Law Project, are dear grantees of the foundation. We will connect with you more about yeah, that um, after this. Like Kate it. and I will do that, and uh, you are totally okay. right. Uh, work together and uh, solidarity, right, in yes, practice. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. So I have a hand here, a hand there, and a few others. So we're going to go this way, is that okay? The way yeah, will go no, this way. The way, all right. Um, are you guys? And then we'll get a few of questions, and then if there's anything that we want, we can comment on, we will, is that okay? Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is April. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to tell you a little short story. 
Uh, you have a 12-year-old girl who's um, raped, and the system has her come and point out the victim, point out the suspect, which, and then after she points them out, they don't ask her if she's okay or anything afterwards. Um, never get no type of uh, help, no type of, um, because what do you tell, what does a single mother of nine other, eight other children tell this 12 year old, what, what question does she ask her? So the DA is, oh, it's gonna be okay, just point him out, point him out, and then they leave her for dead. So now she has a title of victim. Mm -hmm. The same court, 10, 12 years later, sentenced this victim mm -hmm. to two life sentences. And um, no mitigating nothing. Just mm -hmm. that 12 year old same, that person that that, that, vic that that happened to at 12 years old is still abiding in this 24 year old. Mm -hmm. The only thing that happened, the only changes was the calendar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now the victim is now, has another title, a criminal. Mm -hmm. She goes to prison with two life sentences don't know how to act because it's pain and it's hurt and it's survival of the fittest. So now she has another title. She's an inmate. So she walks through the prison system, still, that 12 year old girl is still walking. She's walking that prison system. Don't know, has no idea how to surface. So she's just doing, going along with the program till she finds somebody who can tell them how to get out of, how to get out of prison. Now she has another title, parolee. Mm -hmm. One thing that's great, paroling. Somebody paroled a few years before them and laid a foundation, a safe place to land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And her name is Susan Burton. Mm -hmm. And this, this young lady that's 12 years old, never has been in a safe place in her life to Susan Burton gave her a new way of life, mm -hmm. which is a foundation in Los Angeles that's saving lives. Yeah. Yeah. So all the titles that was put on this 12-year-old, this victim, this criminal, this inmate now parolee, Susan Burton was able to give her a title of housing coordinator, which is myself. I was that 12 year old. I was that criminal. I was the inmate, and now I am a parolee, but I'm also a coordinator. You guys keep talking about leadership. I am for the first time in my life, a leader of something that I am positive for, mm -hmm. that I'm looked at positively. Mm -hmm. Outside of these doors, when I go back to Los Angeles, California, when I'm not in a new way of life from surrounding, I am still a parolee, mm -hmm. but I'm walking a different walk, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's by people funding, by people mm -hmm. giving, and making this possible for women. Mm -hmm. I'm a yeah. woman today. Yes. For women like yes. us to flourish, to shine. I'm a role model. I come from Compton, California. I did 28 years in prison. Mm -hmm. I've been out 18 months. I can stand here today. I am a role model. Yes. Wow. Why? Yeah. That was also one of our grantees in the very early stages of Susan Burke putting it together. It is such a blessing. So what? It, it, it's like when I sit here in front of you, Susan is not here. I'm here. I'm here. I'm standing in the gap because not only. Does she help me? There are women behind me that are waiting. That's right. Yes. They are waiting. There are lines and lines and lines and lines of women who are waiting mm -hmm. so she can help them see something in them mm -hmm. that she sees That's that right. we didn't see at first. Mm -hmm. But the patience and the time and the, 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 the just the little things. <coughs> I don't know how many of you guys have been in prison, and I tell this story all the time. To come home and walk on carpet, mm. or to take a shower with no shoes on, mm. you feel me? Nobody mm. To open up the refrigerator and know that that milk right there is yours, you can have it, and it's not 
the ex expiration date is not tomorrow. Mm. You know what I mean? So the, 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 the funding that is given, when you guys look at me, don't just look at me. Look at all my sisters that are in prison because we are getting letters. We are getting letters. I am. I do the correspondent. There's at least 600 women yeah. lining up to get in our houses. Let's help them get in these houses. Absolutely. Let's help them. Thank you, everyone. Yes. I just want to tell everybody that before we begin the panel, this is who you are to me. I didn't know you before today. Um, just before everybody came, April was here early, and you know, we said, I'm April, I'm Anna. And, um, you know, then we talked about the energy of spring because of April's name. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, you know, I went on my thing about April said she wasn't born in April, and then she said she was born in September, so I said you were Virgo. Virgo, Virgo, September 1st. And you, so who you are today, I just wanted to give that back is a huge, loving, warm person yeah, yeah, that brings all of you yeah, with you. Yeah, but, exactly. you know, you are so much bigger than any of those yeah, things, you absolutely. know, and you just yeah. existed today in a very, you know, that way for me. So I just wanted to give that back to you. Thank you. Okay, we have a question there. Yes. Um, good afternoon. I'm Roy Waterman. Um, I'm the Criminal Justice Project Manager for an organization called the Jewish Council of Public Affairs. I'm also the co-founder of an organization called Drive Change. Um, so when it comes to philanthropy and thinking about philanthropy, and to speak to you, April, I'll first say to you, welcome home. Thank you. Yes. So, yes. Um, I can relate to a lot of what you said. I'm a former incarcerated man. I've been almost 13 years in prison. And now I am leading a Jewish, a national Jewish organization, and I go around the country educating, mobilizing the Jewish community around mass incarceration and criminal justice reform. Um, and then also, how do we bridge the gap between the Jewish community and communities of color? So, first, I'll say, in speaking to you, April, that you're a queen and you discovered your superpower. You're not a parolee, because I'm big on language, because you're a perfect segue for me. I'm big on language, so in speaking and having people from philanthropy in the room, I also want to address the issue that language that's used in philanthropy, right? You talked about changing culture, but we also got to talk about changing language. We're using inmate, we're using perpetrator, we're using prisoner, we're using felon, we're using a lot of terms that are uh, denigrating, that are embarrassing, that are dehumanizing, and we have to use empowering language to help bring forth dignity and compassion in people. We have to, we're working in this work. We have to be the ones that shift the tone for the rest of society to listen. And we cannot use the same language as the rest of society. Absolutely. Especially when we're trying to get compassion from the rest of society. So I, I, I um, come to this work, and I've spoken to several foundations, and I just received um, funding from the Rockefeller Foundation with my organization. Um, and I find myself in places and spaces and speaking to funders often because I do fundraising um, and I'm always challenging them not just to, yes, help or like give money to organizations that are led by formerly incarcerated people, but also look at bringing people in in capacity of fellow paid fellowships oh, at a livable yeah. wage. So let me say that again. Yes, yes, yes. At a livable yes. yes. wage. Yes, yes. totally. Um, to me, is very important. Employing people at executive position to decide on grant making as well yes. should be factored into the equation. It was mentioned earlier about having a person on your board mm -hmm. that is also could be directly impacted. I believe that you cannot frame conversations or even think about engaging in conversations without being led by those who are most harmed and impacted. And that goes not just for criminal justice, mm -hmm. that goes for immigration or any other topic Everything. we talk about. Yes. We should be led yes. by those who are most impacted um, and so when it comes to philanthropy, I thank you because you are very unique. But my question to you is, what are you doing to impact yes. the field? Because I know you go to meetings, <laughs> yes. and I've heard about meetings mm -hmm. with funders where it's 100 people in the room, all foundations, and it might be one person of color that's represented in this room. 
So what are you doing as far as messaging and articulating to other foundations? They should not only be A, adopting what you're adopting now, but B, bringing people in a leadership capacity that are directly impacted. Well, the first thing I want to say is that, you know, I have, I don't have that superpower to make all other foundations do what, you know, I think they should do. That's, that's, it's, the reality is that it's their money, their decisions, they're going to do what they want to do. However, that said, I would just say that, um, you know, as I, as I spoke earlier, when we started CJI in 2000, and 2000 right after the critical resist, the first critical resistance conference, there were not a lot of organizations funding in the criminal justice field. And, um, and people kind of thought we were a little crazy when we started it. And they thought we were crazier to have activists and donors sitting around the table together. They thought it was going to be a power dynamic and the donors were going to try and dominate everything. It was the exact opposite. They were deferring to the activists because they knew they had the lived experience. There's a lot of education that was going on. And as a result of that, a number of our donors, because the reality is that most donors don't just give to one organization, right? So they learned a lot. And they learned a lot about valuing the participation and input of people who are directly impacted, which they took to their other places of giving. And so a num there were several funds that were started, like we had a Beyond Prisons Fund we had that was started by someone who came out of our circle. Um, Catherine Raphael went into the Women Donors Network and started a Criminal Injustice Fund, which I think they're now reorganizing, reorganize, but that was out of that. Um, another one of our donors was worked on a fund with um, uh, youth in Louisiana and included activist advised um, grant making in that. And so um, I think that the reality is that good ideas, when people share about them, then they pick them up and they keep moving forward. And then the more people keep asking them more about that and then people start thinking about changing their structures in, in ways to do that. But I myself can't make anybody do anything. The other thing I would like to say is that sometimes what we do is, because I have because I have donors that are, you know, giving in several places, we might say, okay, this organization is now gone, gone too big for us because we have a, a pretty low threshold, $550,000 in the max budget. So what we do is we try to figure out how can we help them get to the next stage of funding. And so um, that's one of the other things that we do. We help, like we might have, for example, TGI Justice was one of our earliest grantees, right? We were one of the earliest uh, grantees of that organization. And then they were at a place where they were having some financial issues. So we were like, well, what can we do? We had one of our donors then call a meeting with Solid Air, and then they sat, they had a whole convening with other funders, and then now TGI Justice ended up being way too big for us to fund because their funding increased largely because we helped bring them to the attention of other funders. So that's the other thing that we try to do through our, through our donors and other places. Um, and, and, and then we, you know, we write up these grantee profiles that other people see, and it's to help give these small organizations some presence and some visibility so that other funders might pick them up. So that's, that's what we can do. So I can quickly address this. So, hello, welcome home. So I was um, in the foundation. I also started out with Eddie Ellison Devon Pryor, who started the language. OSF did fund. OSF did fund them. So I'm going to challenge you because even in our fellowship community, in our formerly incarcerated community, that's a debatable to this day. There has been people, leaders, in other states that want to adopt that language and say it. So this, I'm telling you the challenges that I see that we got to get our community tight and right. Mm -hmm. Our foundation, we try really hard. When we, we see thousands of fellowship applications for formerly incarcerated, yeah. and it grills me. I'm a convict. I'm a this. Yeah. So I'm not going to sit here and say, you have the right to say what you want and claim what you want. But what the devastating effect of it is. But we really, really, really try. But at the same time, I'm going to challenge another thing. It's the media and communications. Yeah. And so we have a lot of media fellows. And this has been a contentious point of, as Susan, we've been saying, we brought this up at a conference about how, because I've been displayed in the media lots of times in my earlier year. And the problem is, is we ask them, in order to sell their subjects, they are being sold out. And so they're always challenged, like, we, we push back, we push back, we push back. 
and but the story is important. What do we do? So even the media makers, because as you know, the media about ten years ago just collapsed. So everybody's a freelancer. So they're really busting their ass trying to get their stuff published. I almost wished. Oh well, nobody's in here for media. But so so even that, yes, we try, we try, but we got to get our own community right and tight. We got to listen to the media makers that are coming out and what they're challenging, and not just philanthropy. I do my thing with philanthropy, and I think the Justice Fund does really really good. And but we also have to support and get on these editorial boards. Um, we have one right now who used to be a social justice fellow, mm -hmm. Wagner. Um, oh my God, maybe I'm having a brain fart at this moment. Mm -hmm. But he is now on the editorial board and he's very cautious. When anybody puts an edit in um, the New York Times, he's like, no, we're not gonna say that language. Mm -hmm. But that's what we need to talk to too, is all the people that are buying these stories, all out in the end, and our hip hop community, hello. I mean, going yeah. to jail has got to stop. I have a black son I am raising, and I'm like, to go to jail is not a badge of honor, and they want to come out and they want to slap you with a million dollars and say, go ahead, but they are, they are banking their next song on going to jail. So we have a lot of work to do, and they are part of our community because they had the rough bringing, but they still want to emulate and bank because incarceration people is not the next sexy best issue because it's so sexy out there to be incarcerated. It just dry, and Orange is a New Black makes me mad as hell that that's out there, but it's out there. So we got, need to bring our own people in this and be accountable because these people buying things and Hollywood buying script and our people being so sold out into uh -huh. scripts that they have no control later on. So this too, we have a lot of work to do. Um, I, I just wanted to say too that um, in 2002-3 we had a focus, a, a grant making RFP was specifically around language, around language um, with because we were trying to increase dialogue between and amongst the movement because people were you know, much more than now working very much in silos around criminal justice issues. So we were trying to get people to talk together. And that's when um, all of us or none pushed this concept of formerly incarcerated people. We, we removed, there, there was no, we didn't actually used to call people inmates or convicts or anything like that. But we had people who were applying that were using language of inmates, convicts, and, and all of that. And we actually put something in our RFP about that so people could see that we were discouraging that language. Um, and, and it's beautiful, I think, how far we've come. We still have a lot further to go, but there definitely has been movement. And I think it's not just about that, it's also about, you know, does the organization that you work with, does the foundation say that they're not gonna discriminate against formerly incarcerated people who apply to get a position in that institution? You know, are they also not gonna invest in private prisons? Are they not, there are a lot of things that are connected to that as we'll larger institutions. Huh? Or have board members that are invested. Yes. Or have board members that are invested in private prisons. All of that. All of that. Yeah. So, um, can you tell that this is an intense conversation <laughs> that we need to continue? The only problem we have is that we are yeah. above our time oh. by a long time. I'll so, take that part. So here's what I'm gonna we're gonna say. We wanted you to know that there are opportunities in philanthropy. We wanted you to know that there are philanthropy activists in philanthropy, and we can talk more about other things that some of us are doing to influence other people. Yeah. Um, remember, think of the community foundations like the New York Women's Foundation for the smaller grants that yeah. can get you going. Yeah. 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 Think smaller of the grants. other foundations, exactly. and we're all connected. We connect, yeah. we yeah. refer yeah. each other, exactly. okay? Yeah. And NOVO and the New York Women's Foundation work together yeah. on a variety of things. Yeah. For instance, the fund. Yeah. Pamela mentioned there are at least two opportunities locally, the Fund for Girls and Women of Color and the Justice Fund, at least. But there are more opportunities. We can hook you up there. We want you to remember that um, if you get lost out there, where do I go? Da, 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 we are the people to call, okay? Beyond funding, just beyond funding, like philanthropy stuff in general. We want it to be in this panel to be useful to you, to be of service to you. Okay, philanthropy doesn't have any place except to be of service to you. So beyond today, please, our information is all here. Yeah. We are accessible people and we have other folk in our teams here. Uh, many of you know us, for those of you that don't know us, 
think you got to sense a little bit that we are committed to your work. We want to thank you for choosing this workshop. Can I just tell you this? We thought nobody was going to yeah. come. <laughs> <laughs> so, 